Hello, thank you for coming to the second reading of Palace of Crones. Um, and our theme tonight is New Beginnings. Um, my name is Ruth Floor, and I'm the director of Word With Rewriting Workshops and also the facilitator of Chalice of Crohn's. Um, we're a group of nine writers and we meet every week for our memoir, memoir group. We sit around the kitchen table and we write our stories and um, I have to say because everyone here is such a writer, a courageous writer, that um, we have really bonded over the last three years, and so we're so happy to be here to share with you our work. Um, I'm guessing some of you may be wondering what a crone is, the way my husband did the day that the morning we asked him, could he please build us a bonfire out back, because we were going to have a ceremony that day, so we had a little explaining to do. <laughs> but he graciously <laughs> did that and went off to work, trusting to come back home to the home. Um, <laughs> anyway. So, um, so some, of you, some of you don't know what a crone is. I have a definition that I'm going to read to you, but I'd like you to listen because I'm looking out in the audience and I'm guessing that some of you will hear your own qualities in this description. Um, the crone is a woman that is gracefully adapting to the process of aging. She inspires others. She is comfortable in her own skin and with her own spirituality. Her intuitive and creative powers are pronounced but what really sets the crone apart is that she embodies a passion, a passion to explore meaning in her life, and she exemplifies an unselfish willingness to share her honesty, knowledge, wisdom, love, and compassion. Tonight we'd like to share with you some of the wisdom that we've gathered through our own journeys, and as um, you may note through our pieces and through your own experiences, wisdom has not come easy. And that's what we want to share with you as well. And also, um, I'd like to say that as Crohn's and writers, we stay committed to take on these challenges of writing about some very difficult times and also some wonderful times that we've had in our lives. And, but as Crohn's and writers, we stay committed to um, stay strong every time we sit down to a blank page. We've done that. <laughs> so... Um, Tonight, also, we'd like to dedicate all of our, the fruit of our labor of three years to our mothers and also to your mothers, who, without their spirits and their bodies, um, our creative lives would not have been possible. So, to her. Okay. So, I'd like to introduce our first reader, Morningstar. Um, Morningstar, who's also the director of the Wendell Chorus. You may know her from that. Um, I'd like to... Morningstar writes with such a deep honesty and beauty that she's melted our hearts many times. And I like, um, we often think that listening to Morningstar is a lot like listening to our morning prayers. Right? <laughs> so please enjoy Morningstar, Daughter of Ruth. Anishinaabe elder in Canada. This is called Chief Bird Woman. Standing beside you near the warmth of your solid body was a gift. Whatever words spilled from you into my ears was what I needed to hear. Your channel was open and so you knew without knowing what each one of us needed to hear. I saw the lioness in your large, featured face. Your strength lay quiet and powerful. Before you struck the center of our frightened egos, your soft heart was the velvet underbelly of the great cat. We traveled for 17 hours to meet you at Thunder Mountain, the place you had prepared for us to shed our skins to loosen our hardened, caked-on beliefs. You traveled 17 hours to meet us 
in a car crowded with grandmothers and grandfathers telling story after story, laughing, always laughing, dependent on spirit to pay the way forward and back. Everything has its own time, you told us, as we folded tobacco into prayer ties, as we lay cedar branches in the lodge, as we drank the teas that would prepare us for a vision if it was ours to have. You knew when it was time to gather, time to head into the mountains, time to sit in silence, and time to listen to every voice around the fire circle that stretched into the mountain night of stars. Long flowing skirts, denim work shirts, deftly embroidered woolen shawls dressed your body, and spirit dressed your soul. It bubbled like rushing water out into your low laugh and your high giggles. It beat the drum in your hand with a resounding wave of sound. It spilled over us all as you called out for tobacco, sage, and cedar, for healing, for release, and for wholeness. I followed you into the darkness of the sweat lodge, into the bright light of the cedar bath, into the places in my heart where I was broken, and you let yourself be used by spirit to repair me. This ritual is not just for now, you said. It is a way of life, to love the water, the air, the earth, and the fire. To love, this is forever. So much I didn't know, so much about who you were, about your journey through darkness, about the ones who held out their hands to bring you to safety, and about how much you had to let go. So much I didn't know now about what, so much I don't know now about what it means to give up everything and what it means to embrace everything, everyone. Lay down your tobacco, you said, and give your thanks. This I do when my mind is confused. This I do when the wind dances through the birch leaves and the woodpecker beats on my heart. After your passing, I feel as though I have been traveling on your wing. A small, shiny black feather nestled between many dark feathers, feeling the wind across our backs as you dip and dive, flying so high with you, Chief Bird Woman. I pray that I will meet you again when it is my time. Died again, born again, that was what it said on your door when I called. just a short poem to the earth, to the new beginning of spring. Pond of plump-bellied tadpoles suspended in muddy shallows, paper-thin moth wing, ostinato of grasshoppers, red wing blackbird calls, insect buzz, bullfrog croak, crow speaks, breath slows, heart aligns unraveled mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it is my honor to introduce Nan. She has been delighting us with her concise storytelling that is sparse and to the point. She's also been surprising us with her amazing memory for detail and the dry humor that brings home her points. It is my honor to introduce Nan, daughter of Wolf. My piece is on the bus. Here we are on a ranch in Wimberley, Texas, and we've just been told we have to move. Landlord is concerned because we were smoking pot with his son. Guess where we got the pot? <laughs> I didn't really think this was the reason, but whatever. We decided we wanted to move back to Massachusetts, just a little under 2,000 miles away and 30 plus hours. We had a bit of a conundrum. <coughs> Over the years, we had acquired animals and at the time had seven goats, seven chickens, two ducks, a rabbit, 
and a pregnant dog. We racked our brains to try to figure out a solution, and then we saw a school bus, and there was the answer. At a used school bus yard, we bought a 1966 66-passenger international school bus. We had the seats removed, paid $500, and drove it home. We installed a wire fence with a door about a third, a third of the way back of the 35-foot bus. We made a wooden ramp for the goats to get in and out and had a metal hanger welded on the back of the bus to hold the ramp. Some chicken wire was fashioned around the upper shelf, several bays of, bales of hay were on the shelf and around the bottom at the back. In the center we had two bus seats that we had retained with the table between them. We could sit and eat on the table. The table could be shifted and laid down on the seats and covered with a futon for sleeping. Across from the table we had installed <laughs> our wood stove and we could put the stove pipe out the window. Some cabinets and a cooler held our food and cooking utensils. A can of rice had all of our money hidden in the bottom. By the front stairs near the driver's seat, we had a recliner for the passenger. The evening before we planned to leave was a bright, moonlit night. As usual, our ghosts were lying in a circle on the driveway. Dave tried sneaking up on them so he could get them loaded in the bus. From my position, I could see dark shapes in the driveway, Dave as he moved in, and then the dark shapes all dispersing, and Dave lying in the dirt. <laughs> well, that didn't work. So we led the goats to a pen and with feed, and once they were penned up, it was easier to grab them and load them on the bus. The feathered animals were easier, and the dog and rabbit, no trouble at all. We had a passenger. A friend's brother who had loaded his motorcycle in the bus and who we were taking to Oklahoma. We headed north towards Oklahoma. I was taking my shift driving and all of a sudden the bus just stopped. It was going no further. A passerby called a tow truck for us. We were just outside of Sherman, Texas. We hadn't even made it out of the state. <laughs> Because it was late on Friday, there was not much chance we could get any work done before Monday. So the tow truck driver brought us to a parking lot next to a garage with 24-hour bathrooms. Our passenger took his motorcycle and headed home. The folks at the gas station very nicely let Dave, let Dave tools so he could take the engine apart to get to the timing gear, which had broken. By Monday, it was all ready to be worked on, got fixed, and off we started again. I drove the first stretch and got, across, got us across the line into Oklahoma. We picked up two young men hitchhiking. As they get on the bus, the chicken announced the laying of an egg. <laughs> this kind of stopped the young men short. <laughs> and when they were all away in the bus and looked back, they were astounded at the animals looking back at them. <laughs> They had a guitar, and so did Dave, and so I was entertained for a while. We stopped in Oklahoma at a reserve where we let the ducks enjoy the river and tied the goats out to browse. It was a sad story. The river was obviously heavily polluted, but the locals still fished and ate the fish as they had always done. We were waiting for another part. When it came, we rounded everyone up and headed out again. We traveled one day into Missouri where we were able to find a state park where we could park and walk the goats outside. We had been getting eggs and milk every day on the road. The goats appreciated the new spring leaves on the ranches that we pulled down for them. Shortly after we passed the Golden Arches in St. Louis and started into Illinois, we broke down again. This time we were towed to a garage in Effingham. The garage handled big trucks since Effingham, Illinois was right at the intersection of two major highway routes, Route 57, which went north and south, and Route 70, which went east and west. The police cars had hearts on them, but don't let that fool you. We got quite a response as the bus sat in the garage. The mechanics were not used to seeing goats stick their heads out of vehicles. <laughs> Between the goats and chickens, the sounds were pretty unusual. 
Someone saw us having coffee in a truck stop diner several days in a row and asked <coughs> what we were doing there. We were given the name of a person in Effingham they thought could help, and that's how we met Harry Ward. We talked to Harry on the phone, and he sent one of his workers up to see us. The worker reported back to Harry that yes, we did have goats and chickens and ducks, and by God, we had a rabbit too. <laughs> Harry gave us a place to stay, a place where we could keep the goats, and found homes for the chickens. In exchange for the place to stay, Dave worked for Harry real cheap. Eventually, we got money to fix the bus and get back on the road. We headed back to Texas, leaving our chickens and ducks behind, but with two new goats. <laughs> Sometimes new beginnings don't end up the way you intended. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to introduce Ilana Singh, who in spite of having grown up in India, has learned that a woman does have something to say. <laughs> Ilana, daughter of Dorothy. <laughs> Well, it's a treat to be here in your very sweet library. And um, I did grow up in India, and uh, a lot of uh, the traditions there are very much a part of my world. And so it begins with a poem called Adolescent Dreams. Well, it's got a life of its own. <laughs> As you know, arranged marriage is a core tradition in India. So adolescent dreams. Movies reveal the life we never see. We all know how it's meant to be. His tender touch, her downcast eyes, modesty. I dream of weddings and the bride is me. We all know how it's meant to be. The white-skinned beauty, jewels and gold. I dream of wedding and the bride is me. Father will choose the groom, it is foretold. The white-skinned beauty, jewels and gold. I dwell in the land of panic and desire. Father will choose the groom, it is foretold. Power and wealth, the qualities he admires. I dwell in the land of panic and desire, longing for tenderness, love, and passion. Power and wealth, the qualities he admires, I must surrender to the bonds he fashions. Longing for tenderness, love, and passion, compliance and submission, all I see. I must surrender to the bonds he fashions. Those satisfactions are only in the movies. His tender touch, her downcast eyes, modesty, movies reveal the life we never see. <laughs> well, growing up in that tradition, there's a lot to figure out in order to land here and now. And this is part of that journey. And this poem is called What It Means to Be Human. It means being the nexus of conflicted desire, owned in the secret places of body and heart, the scalpel of suspicion always investigating are they mine or not mine, self or other. It means being expanded when inhaled by beauty, Pieta and Madonna coursing through our body and for a time the sacredness of spirit dwelling with assurance in the realm of the divine. It means being fraught with the rampant desire, discontent a blade at our back, <coughs> ceaselessly urging the need to scale the limitless heights of primitive hungers that cannot be assuaged. Yet it also means the ready dissolution of self-interest in the loving welcome of the heart for 
for the beloved, manifest in the eloquent service of meals and laundry, the nursing of babies at the breast through the night. The tender welcome for the lover, one's body and heart, meeting place and shelter for two souls sur surrendering to the mystery that meets the urgent need for dissolution, the mysterious redemption of coalescing. This last poem is pretty self-explanatory and it's called <coughs> Searching. You come home, you find the tribe has gone on without you. You search for a sign finger through the cold ashes, the earth still warm beneath. Who have you lost in the puzzle spaces between childhood games and the forbidden woman burgeoning within? Ashes and stones. When you were six, you find the doll on the middle, leaking stuffing from her belly limbs unceremoniously askew. You find one leg from Nani's charpai bearing your own teeth marks from when you were two. Her heavy anklets are now bound about your own. Your own mother is gone without a trace. Months later you got word. It was the 14th child that split the bark of her being. Who are you searching for, woman? Who are you missing, you with the man and children of your own? Who do you seek so desperately, scouring the ground for secrets, sifting, sifting sunlight and ashes? Because right now I get to introduce our remarkable leader, Ruth. She is uh, really confident and spacious in her comfort with the language and with leading us into all kinds of absurd self disclosure. <laughs> so, for that, I would like to introduce Ruth, the daughter of Alice. So I'm just going to give you a little background about my piece. Um, I've been working on a memoir called My Life as an Army Brat, Lots Left Behind. And um, this is an, an excerpt from the final chapter, When We Become Civilians. Um, my dad had just returned from Vietnam. It was his last tour of duty. And um, he convinced us we were all going to move to Florida. And he somehow managed to convince us that it was a paradise that he was taking us to, which was no small feat, because we were used to traveling, and we'd been to castles and salt mines and ridden camels and elephants and um, been to opera houses and museums. And, um, but but he, he convinced us, and so we were all gung-ho to go to Florida. And when we got there, he, he had gone before and got himself a job. He had been a helicopter pilot, but he got himself a job as a carpet salesman at Sears and Roebuck. <laughs> and um, bought us our very first house that we owned, a three-bedroom, two-bedroom house. And my brothers and I were excited because we, we got our own bathroom. And he picked us up at the airport, and we got off the plane. It was in Orlando, which was not an international airport at the time. It was a very small, one-terminal airport. And we got the plane, we got out of the airport, and we're like, well, there's some palm trees, this is looking promising. And then we looked over and we saw two guys with long hair, and my brother and I looked at each other, this might work out, this would be okay. <laughs> he lived his life with a buzz cut. And so we get in the car and we start driving through the outskirts of Orlando, and um, a few miles down the road we notice that we're only seeing um, palm scrubs and, or, and orange trees and we keep driving down 436 and it's about four miles and then we finally turn off on the Loma Avenue and, we, and then we see this giant 
cement block sign and it says in bold letters, Eastbrook. He had, my father had bought us a three bedroom house in a subdivision in the middle of nowhere. So it didn't take long for my brother and I to figure out that we were not, had not landed in paradise, we were actually trapped. <laughs> so, my piece is called On the Road with Jack Kerouac, Finally. The whole mad swirl of everything that was to come began then, Jack Kerouac. It was the day after Christmas and the Florida sun had once again ruined everything. No snow, no bundling up in new Christmas sweaters and scarves and hats with pom-poms. There was no ice skating on the pond, no thermoses full of hot chocolate, and no fire pits to warm mitten hands. For us, it was halter tops, cutoffs, and flip-flops, the official uniform of Florida, even in December. As far as I was concerned, Florida didn't do much of anything right. It was just wrong. And the subdivision of Eastbrook, which cut me off from the rest of the world in all directions, with two miles stretches of four house plans repeated over and over on each street, felt even more wrong. It was 1969, and I was 16 years old. While wild hippies with flowers in their hair lived in exotic places like San Francisco, dancing to Janis Joplin and Jefferson Airplane, we teenage inmates of Eastbrook were on our knees pulling out weeds in our father's meticulously groomed backyards, trying desperately to drown out our boredom by blasting rock and roll on our transistor radios. As we yank goose grass and bull thistles from sandy soil, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, and Led Zeppelin saved our souls, promising us revolution and untamed love. And even though I had no idea what the song was about, the long version of Iron Butterfly's Inagata de Vida filled me with 17, would fill me with 17 minutes of un interrupted bliss. That lengthy ballad was good to see me through the weeding of nearly a quarter of our rectangle of the backyard. <laughs> on this particular day, I was on my bed playing guitar. It was in the middle of the afternoon, and I was imagining myself someplace cool like Haight-Ashbury, Greenwich Village, when the sound of everything that was to come coughed through my window. Rev, sputter, sputter, rev, sputter, sputter, <laughs> silence followed by wild beeping. I ran to my window to see what the heck was going on, and I hear my name scream, screamed, Ruth, Ruth, get out here, and more wild beeping. I panicked, and I ran out the front door, and there she was, Susan Carrick, sitting in her brand new, dark green Volkswagen Beetle, her mouth hanging open, her eyes shockingly <laughs> wide, her hair a honey brown bonnet of tangles, Susan starts beeping and bopping up and down and yelling, get in, get in, let's go for a ride. I'm thinking, no way, Susan Carrick got a damn car for Christmas. I wish I was the only child and got a car for Christmas. My parents would never get me a car. In that same moment, my brain lights up with revelation. The next best thing to having my own car is my best friend having her own car. <laughs> I run over to the green chunk of freedom and thrust myself into the passenger seat. I know that our lives are about to change. We're about to be on the road. Because there's nowhere to spend money in Eastbrook, Susan and I have stockpiled mounds of babysitting money. We realize we could fill this car up with enough gas to get us anywhere. We could drive to the mall. <laughs> we could drive to the parking lot, circle at Steak and Shake, and drive around as many times as we wanted. <laughs> we could drive to Daytona Beach. Hell, we could pin flowers in our hair and drive all the way to San Francisco. Just as soon as Susan learned to shift from first to second. <laughs> that day, we sputtered and stalled all over Eastbrook. We blasted the radio station and sang to the world. We sang with Rod Stewart and Neil Young. We twanged with Bob Dylan. We rolled down our windows and stuck our whole heads out, letting our long hair blow in the wind at 10 miles per hour. <laughs> they were the answers blown in the wind. Eventually, Susan learned how to drive in earnest, and that humble green beetle freed us from the confines of Eastbrook. We were finally on the road with Jack Kerouac, and the whole mad swirl of everything that was to come on our road to adulthood began then. <laughs> So now it's my 
honored to introduce my friend Sharon, who, um, whose work, she writes about the natural world with the, the eye of Mary Oliver, and then turns around and writes about the social world with the, she, with the sword of a revolution. <laughs> I find her work both breathtaking and cathartic. I also love working with, work, writing with Sharon because she's also my sister service brat. Um, Air Force, right? Army. Oh, Army. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. We're so, we have a little thing about whose dad was the highest off her dad. Was high officer. <laughs> That's okay. We got over it. We got over it. But anyway, it's really nice to write with her because whenever we write a piece about our life as military brats, we just look at each other like we know. And then we write some more. <laughs> so it's my pleasure to introduce Sharon, daughter of Virginia Lee. So I'm going to read, a, I guess you could call it a poem and then a piece. Uh, this first is uh, from a prompt. Ruth mentioned the prompts that are back there in a bowl. So she gives us these little tidbits to write from. Um, and as she mentioned, um, I'm also an army grad and moved all over. Never really had a home. Until recently. Well, in the last quarter century. That's <laughs> so, so anyway, this is called I Am From. I am from the spirit of curiosity, action, and adventure. I am from the yearning for a long time home. I am from the sandy red Georgia clay and the secret mossy spring beneath aspens high in a rocky mountain meadow. I am from the giant blocks of black Irish rock where we harvest seaweed. I am from the hills on the eastern edge of a broad river valley where the purple mountain pumps up northward at sunrise. <laughs> so this next piece is called Breathing. Always a good thing to do. Um, the earth breathes. The earth respires, inspires, inhales, exhales. In the Colorado Rockies upland foothills, where I lived in a wooden cabin, I'd lie in my cozy bed listening to the wind, an inverted ocean rumble down from the peaks of the maroon bells. Like the sea working its way up to a full moon high tide, on a stony beach, the wind roared and crashed, exhaling mightily. It blew fine snow into, uh, in under the not quite tight cabin door, rattled the hapless aspens, and filled in the track I'd shoveled to the outhouse. The gale terrified and transported me, presaging my awe when I met the Wyoming wind god face to face in remote canyon country. As I'd walked a narrow ridge, he rose up from the ochre depths, Full white beard, fierce, seasoned face, wind whipping his hair. The thrill of recognition and fear settled into gratitude as we communed for a moment. He nodded appreciation, I nodded back, and he blew away down the canyon. And I felt the earth's powerful inhalation. In an alpine valley where I lived, below the Tsukspitze <laughs> spiking the sky, its sharp edge traced pink in the rising sun. I walked across the Bavarian village to work, my still wet hair from my morning shower, frozen now, slapped my cheeks. Part of the way, I followed the town's cows on their way to mountain pasture. Each lived in their stall in the first floor of their house, and as the cowherd passed down the street, the cows emerged and joined the orderly throng one by one. As it was a tidy community, the most junior cowherd fell in at the rear, scooping up the cow pies, so the streets were clean when I walked through. There was one particular day that felt oddly ominous, despite the sun's cheer. The wind, I could see, blasted across the mile-high mountain ridges, 
dawn snow streaming from the edges, but an eerie quiet blanketed the valley floor. Inhaling, that hard, high wind sucked the air from the valley, dulling the senses. They have a word for it, food. When the wind makes a determined effort to create a vacuum, air pressure so low that it's known to derange humans. I'm told that even the courts exonerate people's crazy behavior in a theory. It's the earth taking a deep, deep breath in here. A winter morning from my front porch, sedate, rounded Mount Monadnock rises to the north, its rocky top covered with snow, a breath, <laughs> steady carries the chickadee's January song of impending spring, and the breeze ruffles bare tree reflections in the front yard's pocket pond, shimmering the silver sky. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, it's been really wonderful writing with our chalice of crumbs for the last three years, and I feel like I've learned a real lot from from everybody, and um, from Nancy, who I get to introduce. Something that I've learned, not necessarily taken into myself, but I learned that it's possible, um, is a sense of serene perseverance, which I really appreciate. So I want to introduce Nancy whose mother, she's the daughter of Shirley. So my story is um, about my 50th birthday, which was uh, at this point the probably the worst period of my life between the things were going on at the time. And uh, it felt like a time where I uh, began to uh, find some resilience, a sense of resilience. <clears throat> uh, birthdays ending in zero are thought of as milestones. I don't really recall my 10th or my 20th, uh, other than marveling at double digits and then at no longer a teenager. On my 30th birthday, when my generation thought that meaningful life would end and you can't trust anybody over 30, <laughs> I celebrated the day at my workplace at Franklin Nursing Home's monthly birthday party with one resident turning 65 and another turning 100 on the same day. That put a whole different scale of perspective on my mm -hmm. day. And my 40th, having just proposed marriage to Rick on Sadie Hawkins Day, mm -hmm. we vacationed at the Kai Loom Camp Tell on the Yucatan Peninsula with friends and planted our guest list and party. Around my 50th birthday, life was complicated by so much turmoil that all I wanted to was to retreat to Kripalu to learn to transform stress. No party, please. Leading up to my 50th, my friend Julie, who had gone off with the Heaven's Gate cult over 20 years before, led 37 others into suicide as the Hale-Bopp comet sped overhead. My gentle friend's public death was particularly numbing because she was instrumental as the nurse of the group in creating and administering the lethal cocktail that ended all those lives in such an orchestrated way. Magazines and newspapers described her as lost and troubled, and I was blown away to see her vacant, bloated face on the midday TV news as I was passing medications in the nursing home dining room one day explaining in a pre-recorded video why she was about to kill herself. On St. Patrick's Day, 1998, a 13-year-old boy in Asheville, North Carolina, goaded on by two older teens, shot my friend Kathy, who previously lived here in Warwick, by the way, uh, in the head. Part of me just wanted to drop all my work and family responsibilities and go care for her, cook for her, support her and her family through this trauma and her recovery. She had always felt like a close relation from another lifetime. 
muddling these thoughts while I was driving on Route 2, I was stopped and ticketed for speeding because I was, indeed, not paying full attention to my driving. Also at this time, both my kids were causing havoc in their own ways. My daughter was hanging out with the wrong crowd, and my son was studiously unengaged in classes at GCC while working at Mount Snow on the Slopes. Both were emotionally distant and angry, and I had never really wanted to parent teenagers. <laughs> my dad, a smoker for decades, had a lung cancer diagnosis and had undergone a lobectomy in April, followed by radiation starting in June of 1997, which may have offered either a little longer life or a little longer death, depending on your point of view. By the time of my birthday in March of 1998, he was losing weight and starting to fall. Both he and my mom separately shared that they thought he was no longer in remission, but they couldn't talk to each other about this. I decided I had to go down to Florida to meet with them and his doctor and fix this mess. The catalog for the Kripalu Center for Yoga and Health promised their workshop would teach tools to transform stress, which was certainly what I needed. Becoming a half century old felt like an accumulation of burdens, and I thought I sought to experience um, uh, another way to meet these challenges. The techniques taught there helped center me through the visit with the parents in Florida, leading to an open discussion of Dad's cancer diagnosis or di cancer progressing and a hospice referral. They presented a smorgasbord of techniques that can help relieve tension and fear, focus on the moment, listen to the messages in my body and breath. There were restorative yoga poses, breath work, practicing loving kindness, meditation, journaling, walking in nature, all in a retreat setting with daily yoga classes, dancing to live drums, and beautiful food. My dad was not an ideal patient, but the feeling of centered calm soaked in a Kripalu, nevertheless helped me to deal with him and my other challenges, exceeding my expectations. In the midst of such a with so many events beyond my control, was the beginning of learning to change what I had the power to change, starting with my attitude and stance towards life's stresses through daily self-care. Becoming more committed to making time for a daily yoga practice and frequent walks outdoors, for example, helped me to feel physically strong and emotionally focused to continue working through my late 60s. The gift of this stressful period was my beginning to become a more dispassionate observer, to note that letting life flow around me from a place of centered calm itself changes situations for the better. Mm -hmm. So I'm happy to introduce Shell, who's a musician and energy conductor uh, who's landed in Wendell from Canada. Uh, her writing is full of grit and spirit, and uh, I give you Shell, who's the daughter of March. this thing on? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on, so. <sighs> this is what happens when you become a crone. <laughs> Be careful what you wish for. It's several hours after my last healing session, and I'm totally spent. As today's clients brought their heaviness to me like a wet, sticky, blanket. As a healer, I've learned to clear myself after working with others, but today seems to be requiring more effort for me to let go of their offerings. My plan to run the errands in need of my attention today seem overwhelming after my work, so I decide to take the, an intentional long cleansing shower. It's going to do me best. I luxuriate in the magical warmth of the water imagining that today's shared energies are washing their way down the drain, returning to the earth to become compost. 
envisioning the complete rainbow spectrum in each water drop, I intend the removal of that which no longer serves my highest and best good. Off with you now. As I move from my body to nourish and move my lymph and blood system, my breath begins to deepen. Inhaling the glorious essential oils that diffuse from the steaming washcloth I've dropped at my feet, that's more like it, I say, chanting Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Then I crank up the hot water, squealing with delight. I brace my arms up against the wall, turning just the cold on. Hydrotherapy it is, and my entire body wakes up. It's incredible what happens to me when water meets this fiery girl. It's a cleansing celebration. And the floor is never dry. <laughs> Even my drying off is purposeful. As I move the towel along my body, following the flow of the life-enhancing meridian systems in their proper way. This was definitely a better choice than running those errands, I decide. Now I just need to get a little snack and all will be well. But as I make my way toward the kitchen, I hear this loud banging noise. What is that, I, I wonder? Continuing to meander my, my way toward the living room, thinking that our crazy neighbors must be up to something again. And then I see it. Dark, billowing smoke has filled up my healing room, and flames are sparking throughout the space. I jump into action, grabbing the dusty fire extinguisher from behind the cellar door. I charge on head first into the smoke. I'm moving so quickly, I'm not even aware that this extinguisher is so old, perhaps it isn't even equipped for the job at hand. But with eyes closed, I go in swinging anyway. I, just, I direct the extinguisher's nozzle toward the noise, but the thick smoke finds its way to my eyes and my lungs, and I'm forced out of the room, tearing and coughing over and over for what seems like eternity. Composing myself, I wet a kitchen towel, apply it to my face, and push my way back into the smoky room, knowing that there's no turning back. I get down on the floor, I crawl through the dark, the dark smoke with the fire extinguisher, expressing itself from my hands, my wild aim missing the target. I can't see anything. <laughs> I get up, slamming the door behind me, I return to the safety of our kitchen. Then a huge crash resounds as the fire explodes, cracking open the large window that looks into our wooden yard. Knowing I can no longer open this door due to a backdraft, I fly out the front door, trying to beat the fire from taking our home. As I run around the side of the house, I see that the way is blocked by my man's work ladders. I scream, help, great, help, help. Help! Please! Someone! There's a fire! As I quickly change tack, I run around the other side of the house, cursing all the way like an angry sailor. <laughs> Using my shirt sleeve, I open the hot latch to the back door, and the smoke engulfs me, making its way out to the yard. But I now have a visual on the fire, so given it all I got, I direct the extinguisher with the bristling hot flames until there's nothing left. <laughs> <laughs> and then my body collapses. <sighs> Having heard the commotion. <laughs> Our neighbors show up just in time to see me falling to the ground. I'm a mess. Crying and dirty, my emptied adrenals are so pained it feels like I've been kicked in the back by a horse. And as my friends help me back into the moment, my mind clears and I sadly realize that I'm actually the one responsible for starting the fire. Feelings of remorse and gratitude simultaneously overwhelm me strangely. I see that I'm protected. I see that I'm okay, and I sit amazed with, with what's actually taken place here. <laughs> this afternoon, I'd emptied the cold ashes from a very, very early morning fire into a plastic bucket. Unbeknownst to me, a spark was still alive, tiny little spark hidden amongst those ashes, and that spark scent spent several hours melting that bucket down to then ignite the papers that were sitting right beside my wood stove. Oh, thank heavens I didn't go run those errands today. Taking inventory of my healing room, I see that both of us are now in need of some serious healing. My mistake will cost us time and energy and money, so I'm certain that my man will be put off by my carelessness when he returns. And yet, in some strange way, I feel like all is well. Hmm. Remembering a few days ago, I've been in my healing room and I said out loud, 
I wish I could totally power wash this room and give it a fresh coat of paint. <laughs> it's dusty high ceilings, a safe haven for spiders and other creepy crawlies, along with its tired aging paint. They were all in need of attention. But I couldn't do it. I didn't have the money, I didn't have the time, I didn't have the wherewithal. But now, <laughs> my sacred space is going to get that well-deserved facelift, all because of one pernicious mistake. As parents, my man and I have always told our kids that mistakes and failures are a direct route to success. It's how we learn and grow as humans. And here I am, living proof of this understanding. Even though I'm remorseful for my actions, I'm thrilled to see the manifestation process in full bloom and know that I've learned a profound lesson. Words backed by intentions and emotions are the perfect recipe for realizing our desires in this physical world. I'm going to say that again. Words backed by intention and emotions are a perfect recipe for realizing our desires in this physical world. And so a new fresh beginning takes place and my healing room gets professionally cleaned, spray washed and painted a beautiful sky blue color and I didn't have to do any of it. <laughs> but this intense experience changed me cellularly. And as I sit reflecting, I hear the voice of my deceased mother. Be careful what you wish for, Shelley, because you are sheer, surely likely to get it. And Mom's words leave me smiling, knowing that I did exactly that. <laughs> I would still fight the fire, sorry, I know. People are like, call 911, I'm like, give me the extinguisher. <laughs> Some people never learn. <sighs> So what's really beautiful about this chalice of crones, as you've already discovered halfway through or two-thirds through our process here tonight, everyone has such different experiences and perspectives that we all get to share and bring to each other. Energy is different. Depths of perception different. And it's just such a beautiful, beautiful experience to help all of us grow. And so it's now my pleasure to introduce a very dear friend and a magical woman who helps so many people with her deep wisdom as a therapist, working with tarot, and mystical writing, always with a lesson, a deep, deep lesson. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you my friend Kai, daughter of Esther. This piece is called The Fall of the Giant, and I'm dedicating it to my father, Jerry Judd. <clears throat> A giant has fallen, a bright light who promised clarity in a world of chaos, a dreamer who dreamed and created new worlds, the 100-year-old patriarch who ruled his family by the strength of his will. Gone in a moment, gone, as the striving for breath finally gave way to something stronger something more compelling, something new and unexplored. I was called deep in the night, hurry, come when you can, we need your help. My father's wife had texted me from the local hospital. The doctor says his situation is critical. I must get to him, but it is still deep in the night. I have to wait until the light of day. I head off into the still pale light and drive straight into winds, wild and fierce. The car is buffeted by gusts that pick me up and drop me violently, like a bucking bronco that wants to throw me from its back. Any other time, I would have given into the power of the wind and turned around. But I've heard the call and must move through my fear into the unfolding. I arrive safely, shaken from my perilous journey. The giant is not going gently into the night. The wild winds have come to accompany me. I find my way up to the hospital floor where the giant is ensconced. His blue and white hospital gown falls in chaotic <coughs> folds off his shoulders. Tethered to a web of tubes, he is a shriveled semblance of his once vibrant self. 
His grizzly beard and long gray hair form a wreath around his head, giving him the look of a holy child. When I approach him, there is recognition in his still bright blue eyes, but he is already entering the other world. He tells me there are beautiful children dancing around the ceiling and stars. He wants to make sure that I'm seeing the wonder that he sees. It's so beautiful, he proclaims. So very beautiful. He asks for a drink of water, but I've been told that he cannot drink. Instead, I offer a spoonful of ice, which he spurns. I don't make the rules here. If I did, I could give you what you want. But the doctors are looking out for your well-being, and if you drink, it will go into your lungs and cause you discomfort. He rails again. It's my body, my body. I know what it needs, and it needs water. Jerry, I understand what you're saying, but I have to follow the rules. Have some ice chips. We go round and round a few more times, and I hold my ground. He takes a breath and blurts out, I like you. You're tough. <laughs> he may not have recognized me as Kai, his daughter, but he recognizes our bond, and I'm content. The hospital environment is noisy, chaotic, and harsh, yet the giant continues his relentless protest. This is my body. I'm in charge. You can't tell me what to do. But the sad reality is that he is no longer in charge. And the more he protests, the more it is apparent that his agency is dissolving and that his body is less and less able to support the powerful will that had accompanied him through his lifetime. The giant is disappearing before our very eyes. On the fourth day, I meet our young doctor near the nurse's station. She asks if we are ready to meet with the palliative care team, and then I hear the magic word that I dreamed of hearing, home. Oh, you mean we could take him home? The palliative care nurse and her young intern arrive, both carrying a tenderness that is palpable. The nurse asks Jerry if he knows where he is. He's not sure, but she tells him that he's in Wilson Hospital. She asks if he knows how he got to the hospital, and he responds, I was born in New Bern, Texas, to a minister and his wife, and he begins to recount the details of his life. The young nurse says that she has a lot of patients to see and that she has only a short time to talk with her. He responds that he has a story to tell and that it's important. Okay, she says as they settle in. I'm ready to hear your story. He tells of his youth and how he taught his favorite cow how to dance up on her hind <laughs> legs. How he had taught the confirmation class when he was only 19 and had just started his theological studies at Baylor. How he had met his beloved wife at Yale and accepted her proposal after only four days of knowing her. And how he had lost her in a boating accident when she was only 41. The nurse in her charge <coughs> listened deeply until Jerry is complete with his story. Do you know why you were in the hospital, she asked. No, he answers, curious. When you were being admitted to the hospital for the pain in your legs, you had a heart attack and your heart was seriously damaged. So what do we do to fix it, he asks. There is nothing. The damage is too severe and cannot be fixed. So I'm dying? Yes, you are dying. I never thought it would be my heart. My heart was so strong. Do you want to go home? Oh yes, I want to be with Puffin, my sweet cute. At the end of our meeting, he asks the young man to come close to him. He says, you have a gift. You have the gift of presence. You will do well in your work. I bless you. The young man feels the power of the blessing, and it fills his being. Hours later, we meet with a kind nurse from the Sacred Heart Hospice. She says we can take the giant home and care for him in our own way. I returned to his home and we set the bed up in the kitchen, the heart of the house. The giant returns in an ambulance and is carried up in the elevator and placed in the waiting bed at the very spot 
where he returned every morning from his yoga and meditations, having surrendered his name, his preferences, and having met God. Now he is on his way to the gate where he had passed back and forth daily. Soon there would be no return. He would be forever on the other side. For eight days we care for him with medications, ice chips, clean diapers and linens. His greatest fear had been to be helpless and incontinent, to be diapered and to have to surrender into being cared for. Now this fear has come to pass. And surprisingly, the giant surrenders. Perhaps he has no choice, or perhaps he finally allows himself to have the human experience of being vulnerable without recourse. For me, this is a dream come true. The powerful giant had refused help when he was in his potency. Yet I always wished that someday he would be able to trust in love and lean back in his vulnerability. Now it is a gift that he receives my care. For eight days he struggles and strives. His breath sometimes grows so weak that we are sure that he will not find the strength to draw another. Yet breath comes after breath, even as he grows visibly weaker. His healthy body, the result of his decades of yoga practice, refuses to give up. And then, on a gray winter morning, I sit with my stepsister Heidi as we watch him take his last breath. It is so gentle that there is barely any motion in the fabric of reality. The giant had let go. Free, he soared into the new world, leaving us far behind. It's now my pleasure to introduce my sister Coron Mez. Mez takes us deeply into the beauty and magic of the earth with images that sing to the heart. Please welcome Mez, daughter of Joan. What a pleasure this has been listening to my sister Crohn's and what an inspiration they all are. I have four poems that I'd like to share with you tonight. New Beginnings. Bard Owl called, Who cooks for you? In yonder wood. Who cooks for you? Responded the barred owl, In closer wood. The Big Dipper sparkled in the ink-black night sky, listening to their song. I awake to the spring concert of the morning songbirds flitting about, gracing us with their melodic selves. In the distance, a pileated woodpecker works and works on the aging pine, greeting the day. Happy spring equinox. <laughs> spring snow. I love the sign for snow. Isn't that great? <laughs> um, the large white flakes fall from the sky like dollops of pure sweet frosting on the waiting wedding cake. A flash of rusty red dashes across the stone-littered pasture. Red fox on the move for its morning meal. Los caballos negros. The snow still lays over the pasture on gray glacial rocks, covering them only partially from the impending night. Wisping clouds of another shade of gray are painted in the sky. The pigeons also gray, some with markings of white, coo in their roost down the wet stone path. The two black percherons, 18 hands high, los caballos negros, 
nuzzle each other in the rain-soaked paddock. Playing and talking in a language perhaps only horses speak. They are amusing themselves until till their nighttime ritual of grooming and the feeding of the sweet hay, waiting for the farmer to replenish their water trough so that they may drink deeply. The trees paint themselves black against the lavender-streaked dusk sky, wondering when the wind will come, a chance to dance together into the night. Home sweet home. Another great sign. Home. Eating and sleeping. Isn't that perfect? <laughs> so you do it home. And other places too. Home sweet home. As I lay me down to sleep, butter yellow moon bright interrupting the skylights. Its beam shining in, washing over us, the smooth silver bedside lamp has been turned off. I have rubbed your hard-working hands with lemon coconut lotion to soothe your soul to sleep. I have read the novel at the bedside just long enough and closed its glossy cover. The flowered flannel touches my freckled cheek with the caress of a mother's tender touch. My mind begins to paint pictures of the day I have just journeyed through. I weave the story myself, warp and weft. People, places, sights, sounds, and smells that lead me into the tunnel of my dream time. I often find myself in the same spot. It is wooded. There are paths and two houses. There is love and laughter food and frolic, it is where I will live, home sweet home. <laughs> thank you. We thank you all for coming and bearing witness to Chalice of Crohn's. journey to come over the town line into Warwick from Wendell. <laughs> Some of us know that path better than others and it really is a pleasure to be in our sister town Warwick. A very special and heartfelt thanks to our teacher, friend, mentor, Ruth Floor for guiding us through the journal.